Hello and welcome to another edition of the Understanding Sports and Exercise Medicine Research Show. The show that brings you the latest research straight from the horse's mouth. I'm your host, Tim Travail, from Torrens University in Melbourne. I really enjoyed talking to Christian in this episode today. Christian is a well-known and vocal advocate for high-value musculoskeletal health care. He's often seen lobbying in support of this at all levels, from within the clinic right through to higher level decision and policy makers within government. Those values align well to the vision of this podcast in helping clinicians and early career researchers to really understand the research in order to ultimately deliver higher value care. In this episode, we get into some great detail about progressive strength training programs for people with patellofemoral pain. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of the Understanding Sports and Exercise Medicine Research Show. Today I'm very pleased to be joined by the Dr Christian Barton. I was fortunate to meet Christian about five years ago and I've always been impressed by his research work and particularly his efforts in supporting effective knowledge translation into practice. For those living under a rock and may not have heard of his research, I'll give a quick introduction. Christian spends significant time working in research where he holds a postdoctoral research fellow at the Tribe Sports and Exercise Medicine Research Center and works in private practice treating sports and musculoskeletal patients at Complete Sports Care in Hawthorne. Dr. Barton is also an associate editor and deputy social media manager at the British Journal of Sports Medicine. He has a special interest in knee OA, patellofemoral pain and lower limb biomechanics and is a world leading researcher in these areas. So Christian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me, Tim. Excellent. So before we just get into this research paper, can you tell the listeners a little bit more about your current areas of, of research and clinical focus? Yeah, sure. So I uh, consider myself still a geeky clinician. Um, unfortunately, in research, as you move through, it gets harder and harder to do clinical practice alongside it. Um, and so these days I do one day a week in the clinic. It's usually a long day, 10, 12 hours. Um, and I see a lot of uh, persistent knee pain populations from older people with OA, people with post-traumatic OA who might have had an ACL injury, a lot of patellofemoral pain. I also see a lot of low limb tendinopathies as well. Um, a big mixture of those people are runners, but I also see sedentary people too, so a big variation. Once I get above the hip, I kind of steer clear and handball them off to other staff at our clinic, um, so I'd like more the low limb focus. Um, and I have a particular emphasis in the clinic on trying to combine management of physical and non-physical factors to the conditions. And I think that's something we don't always do very well either in research or, or clinical practice. Um, outside of there, I work at La Trobe University as a postdoctoral researcher. Um, I have a fellowship which is focused on knowledge translation. Um, and a couple of major projects related to that are GLAD, which some people will be familiar with by now. Now, and so we've adapted a Danish program to implement exercise and education for people with hip and knee osteoarthritis. Um, and that's been fun, including doing even telehealth delivery of group exercise there. Um, also do a bit of work in trying to reduce inappropriate joint placement surgeries. And I have a role at the University of Melbourne with the Department of Surgery there and um, working on a couple of projects related to that. And then a, a joint project will hopefully get off the ground when COVID's finished, where we're trying to improve access to non-surgical care for people with OLA who might normally go on to a joint replacement. So that's sort of the implementation projects to work on. Um, I also have a very geeky tendency towards exercise prescription and biomechanics and, and understanding how we can optimize those factors and so we do a few bits and pieces of clinical trials related to that in ACL populations and telephenol and that's one of the ones we'll talk about today and then I have a big focus on knowledge translation as you mentioned not just to physiotherapists but also developing patient education resources so we have some online platforms we've developed for people with kneecap pain or patellofemoral pain um, developing some for plantar heel pain and many of these will start to become available freely available to the public to use alongside their clinical practice soon, which I'm really, really excited about with some of the testing we've done. So that's broadly what I do. That's fantastic. And, and picking up on a few bits there, we can see that we've, uh, this, I think this paper is a nice example where it's not just the consideration of the biomechanical factors. We've got some, those other components being considered and looked at here in this paper, which is great. All right, so just to introduce to the listeners the paper that we're looking at today. So as always, we have, we'll have a copy uh, going onto YouTube so people can follow along and actually look at the research paper. And for the podcast listeners, we always recommend that you have a copy of this paper to hand uh, so you can understand some of the details that we talk through. 
So uh, the original research paper in the journal titled Physical Therapy in Sport, it's titled A Proximal Progressive Resistance Training Program Targeting Strength and Power is Feasible in People with Patellofemoral Pain. Led by yourself, uh, and you've got some co-authors there at, uh, at La Trobe, as well as uh, over in Brazil by the look of it. What's the specific background uh, and why have you decided that this paper was an important addition uh, on top of what already, we already know in the research? Yeah, so we, we know that exercise therapy, um, which can be many different things, is something that's beneficial for people with persistent knee pain conditions like the patellofemoral pain. In fact, there's probably close to 40 RCTs or maybe more now that supports that in patellofemoral pain. It's considered the key treatment that we should provide for this population. Um, what we don't really have a good understanding of is the mechanism of why exercise might help, whether that be physical, psychological, or a combination of those things. Um, and when you read clinical practice guidelines previously in the past or, or recommendations and, and you taught things at courses and university, we're told that we should do strength programs for this population. And a PhD student who's now uh, the lead of the MSc program in London, Queen Mary University of London, Simon Lack, um, a few years ago, we did a systematic review looking looking at exercise, proximal exercise for the, for the, so looking at hip and trunk and the effects of that on telephemal pain, but also mechanics um, and what mechanisms might help. And what was a really interesting element that we included in that review is we decided to look at what type of exercise prescription was being used in these studies reporting that providing hip exercise might be more beneficial in the short term to knee exercises um, and or hip exercises might be more beneficial to not doing exercise. And what we learned was that almost all of the 14 studies included, so 11 of them stated that they were doing a strength training program. And that was in their title, it was in abstract, it was in their aims. But as we dove into their exercise prescription, what we could glean from that, because it's not always well described, is that actually they weren't doing strength programs. If we look at S&C principles, they're actually more so doing endurance-based exercise programs and neuromuscular exercise. And if we look at some other more recent research we've done looking at rate of force development and muscle power where we see really big deficits of that in this patient population at the hip particularly but also the knee only one study actually progressed people to the point of, of doing power-based exercises so in fact in the literature there was really poor evidence that strength training itself was a beneficial thing for patellofemoral pain so we could tick the box that exercise was helpful but was strength or muscle power, so really heavy resistance training, was that something of beneficial benefit to the population? So we didn't really have that answer. And then lots of people have this perception that someone's in pain and you can't actually progress them to these levels and that's why they focus more on your muscular control and, and function and we get very obsessed with trying to control the way people's mechanics are and changing knee valgus, et cetera, et cetera. So part of my other question was, do we need to worry so much about that or is it more about building someone's capacity back up? And then the third part that really informed this was the duration of the intervention. So typically exercise programs in the public literature go for about four to six weeks. Um, and then often they're not given a lot of support going forwards. And arguably you're not likely to see any sustained strength or muscle power gain. So the geeky exercise prescription side of me and clinical bias side of me tells me that addressing these factors, particularly for athletes or people who are running and doing more recreational sports is something we need to do, but we haven't tested whether we can actually feasibly do it or not. So that was what led to this study. That's great. And, and do you think um, historically that clinicians have had a bit of a fear of moving into, into pain? Is that perhaps, or, or is it more of a lack of understanding of actually the metrics of strength versus endurance training when we're looking at exercise or a bit of both? Yeah. You know, I think it's a bit of both. So I think um, pain is often a fear. And we've done some of my qualitative work of talking to physios is they who manage persistent knee conditions, they do have this fear of how to manage pain um, in the context of exercise prescription, and they will typically avoid it altogether. Now, that's not to say that you can't do heavy strength and conditioning work with these patient populations with minimal pain or no pain. It's definitely feasible, and we can talk about that in a little while but there certainly is that fear around not aggravating and flaring up and even when i've taught written some of these papers up both this study and, and other studies looking at um muscle power and making suggestions that this might be an important thing peer reviews come back and go can you really make that suggestion is it sensible aren't we just going to flare these people up so it seems to be a problem in the research sphere as well i just highlighted that actually in research the interpretation of snc guidelines is not great and that people are saying they're doing or testing a strength program and actually they're testing a neuromuscular endurance program. So we have this problem with let's call it exercise literacy from a research perspective. 
perspective. Um, and equally, we have the same in clinicians as well. So we have a big data set of physios and other allied health professionals around the world. And it tells us that there's not really great knowledge of SNC guidelines. So the average health professional out there managing musculoskeletal conditions won't always have that knowledge and understanding about how to prescribe a strength program or a, a muscle power type program to improve those. So I think it yeah, it ties into both the avoidance of pain and also that knowledge and understanding. But equally, there are good clinicians out there too. I must highlight that as well, who yeah. do this well. Of course. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to actually get into the methodology now. So picking up a little bit on the procedures and then particularly the um, the interventions. So we can see from the procedures overall, you've got um, you've got a range of components that obviously tie into your primary and secondary um, outcomes that you're looking for. So do you just want to talk us through the... Uh, the methods as a whole and why particularly and very interested in the why we've chosen this particularly me particular methodology yeah so i think this was a an unfunded study i think that's important to acknowledge yep. and driven by myself and a couple of phd students so the brazilian researchers you saw there they're actually phd students who spent some time with us mm -hmm. so we didn't have the budget to do a randomized controlled trial um but we did have some willpower and some time and, and some clever PhD students to, to work on the methods and, and understanding why and if an intervention like this could be helpful. And so what we're interested in first and foremost is, is it feasible uh, to complete a study like this? So that's our primary aim. So feasibility can look at a whole range of factors. So the first thing we want to look at is can we recruit people into an intervention like this and are they happy to participate? So that's the number one thing we want to tick off from a feasibility perspective. And that's important because you might have an intervention or a study where actually people read the informed consent and they or read the patient information statement and they go, well, actually, I'm not interested in doing this study. I feel like I've done these exercise programs before. I don't want to, I don't want to enroll in this study. Um, how do we recruit them and can we find this patient population? And so from that aspect, we are able to find this group very quickly. So we found them in a matter of weeks and we were recruiting at least a couple of weeks, which was, was quite nice. Then what we want to make sure is that we can retain them as part of the study. So we could certainly do that. And we, we recruited 11 people into this trial. So just a small number. Um, and at the end of the study, we still had 10 of those people mm. that completed the program um, and all at least uh, anecdotally adhered very well. I'll go back to adherence in a minute. Um, the one person that didn't finish the study became pregnant and that was the reason that they didn't finish the study. So I feel like it was very feasible from that perspective. Um, we're also then interested in if we prescribe this exercise program, do people actually do it? And, and so that's part of looking at the, the feasibility of the study. And what we found is using an app called PhysiTrack is that at the beginning, people use this app really well. They had videos of their exercises. They filled out when they did them. They filled out their pain levels and the adherence was quite high based on the recordings from the app. Then when we looked at the data from the app, what happened over time is actually the adherence dropped away. Um, and what was really interesting for us to learn about that is that the actual adherence, at least anecdotally, didn't drop away. People just stopped using the app. And so part of the feasibility for a study like this, if we were to do a well-funded RCT to test this intervention, and we decided we wanted to use this app to monitor adherence, um, and we wanted to look whether that adherence was a mechanism of why someone may or may not get better with this intervention, long and short of it is we wouldn't use this app because people don't use it consistently over time. So that was a really important lesson for us to learn from this small group before we go into a bigger trial. So in subsequent trials, what we've done is we've actually given them the app alongside paper-based diaries, and that seems to improve adherence to actually providing adherence data, if that makes sense. So that's a really important learning. So that was some of the key feasibility things that we looked at. The second part of the study that we wanted to look at is, um, is our intervention achieving what we're aiming to achieve? So I had some very clever students I was working with who we created these really nice methods to almost clinically measure things like muscle power and rate of force development. And so we set up some methods and there's some YouTube videos that describe how to do these. And we measured rate of force or muscle power pre and post the intervention. And so what we could look at is, do we see changes in that? Do we see changes in strength? And if that's what we're targeting with our intervention, we would hope that we actually see those changes. And so we're able to demonstrate with the study that that was the case. And then of course, it's a clinical trial. So another secondary outcome we looked at was, does it actually look like this intervention is effective from a pain perspective? So if we put it into an RCT and had a control group, would we see a big difference in the group who got the intervention compared to what we might see in a control that might show that this has got efficacy? 
safety. And you can use some of that data then to calculate sample sizes you might need, but also give you confidence that the intervention is appropriate. And of course, if you don't find it to be beneficial in this small group, um, then maybe you go back to the drawing board and reframe what you might do. So that was the main rationale for all of these. The other mechanisms we're also interested in, we didn't want to just look at things that we hoped to change, like strength and muscle power. As I said, I'm also interested in education and psychological factors related to the condition. So we wanted to have a look by not intervening on getting someone to be more physically active or have reduced fear. Do we actually change those things anyway? So do we make them more physically active? Do we reduce their fear of movement and, and their pain related fear? So we also included those as outcome measures too. And that provides some interesting findings also. Hey, great. And I, I like the way you picked up on, on uh, the pragmatics of a research and why we actually make a decision. Often, uh, I think research will be critiqued for not doing a certain component, but we have to look at the pragmatics of who's available, what the funding is, all of those components, which are, are so important, but perhaps don't get considered to the end user. I'm noticing that as a kind of starting a, a research journey, how we balance up we can still get a really useful outcomes out of a study like this, even yeah. though it might not be everything that you want it to be in one study. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. And yeah. of course the biggest limitation of this study is the small number and the fact that it's not, there's no control group. So it's not an mm. RCT. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and good to hear that you obviously had very good adherence apart from that, uh, the one pregnancy, which we can see that as understandable dropout yeah. rate. You still, um, that that's, uh, shows good quality there. If we just um, come back to the, I just want to highlight the video resources for a moment. So for people reading the top of section 2.6, there's, there's a bitly hyperlink there that takes us to um, some videos. Uh, and this was something that I really liked, and we don't see it often in the research I read, is really clear either video tutorials or clear open access links to either how the research was done so it can be replicated well or how it can be done from a clinical uh, practice perspective so how can we test these things and make sure we're in alignment with the research we might not be having all the same controls but as close as we can is going to improve our own reliability in, in clinic in the way that we're assessing and implementing the findings from clinical practice so i think we had a brief chat before this and you're looking at um, increasing some of that availability is that right to, to clinicians and patients yeah, and that's a big focus of mine. And you just flagged before that it's really hard to access the appendix, which has the exercise program on it. And so we'll make sure that that's available after this as well. And, and having YouTube videos about how to do these things is useful. And uh, we have a paper at the moment where we've developed an online platform for patients or for people to use or health professionals to use in conjunction with patients. And quite a few of the exercises are actually on there as well um that were used in this study and so hopefully that will be available and freely available very soon we're just waiting on some peer review of some papers related to to that study so hopefully that'll all all be out there okay excellent we're just going to come back up to the um to section 2.3 which is the intervention including pr progressive resistance training approach so first of all i'm just going to screen share and we'll see that each participant was provided with a patient education leaflet and was there actually some education from the physiotherapist to to the individual or was this this was just something that was provided to to them yeah so we, we specifically tried not to give them education because education in itself is a intervention and probably a very yeah. powerful intervention. Yep. So we're really interested in just testing this as a standalone intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and so we gave them a leaflet because we thought that would encourage them that exercise was something that they should do. This was an education leaflet I created with Michael Ratliff a few years ago now. And we've discussed this recently to we need to update this because it still has a very biomechanical slant to it and as with a lot of musculoskeletal conditions we've learned a lot more about the condition from non-physical factors and it'd be nice to include some of that so but it's still a useful leaflet and it's been used by a lot of clinicians over the last few years and it's, we've had a lot of really good feedback about it so it gives some education about load management gives some education about the importance of exercise and why that might be helpful from a biomechanical sense um, so i think it's really important to highlight that if we were to rewrite this education leaflet now, we'd probably add a few non-physical factors and education around that. And so the website I mentioned before that will hopefully be freely available is a lot more holistic in that sense. Yes. Um, but the main focus of this study was really just looking at the, the actual exercise program and seeing yeah. what that would have in terms of an effect in, in isolation. Okay, so I'll just, I'm going to bring up just the actual supplementary material too before that we talked about because uh, I think it's important that the, the listener, we just take the listeners through the actual, uh, th this, um, the 
exercise progressions and the principles. Um, and this was in the supplementary materials too, which as Christian mentioned, where he'll um, working at making that very uh, publicly available soon. So you just want to talk us through, because you've said about what the problems were with the previous literature and the previous types of studies, which weren't specifically looking at strength and power progressions. So what are you really doing differently in here uh, to suit that? Yeah, so we probably, the exercise program we developed and devised probably was very much based on anecdotal experience and clinical experience, but very much also informed by research evidence. Um, and so what we see, you know, group of patellofemoral pain patients is that there are, does seem to be impairments or differences in gluteal muscle function from a neuromotor perspective. So we see delays in activation of the gluteal muscles during certain activities. Um, we see weakness in that area um, and perhaps maybe less muscle function that people don't or they get less muscle function during certain activities. So to begin with, we had a very neuromuscular focus on actually when they were doing exercises like a bridge or maybe some hip abduction exercises, they're actually feeling the load through their gluteal muscles. So using cues like maybe repositioning the pelvis into more posterior tilt or maybe getting to think about engaging those muscles. What we wanted to do though is then from that point is work them through the first week or two of doing some endurance-based exercise, getting them used to loading those muscles, working then into doing actual strength prescriptions. So people often throw out that three sets of 10. Um, but what's important about that three sets of 10, if you do use it from a strength perspective, is it's actually loaded adequately and you can use things like repetition maximum. And so in this study, we use 10 repetition maximum as a testing along the way. And so what we're looking for is trying to get them to work at about their 10 RM level and or they're working at a level where their rate of perceived exertion is quite high. So we're working sort of between seven and nine for rate of perceived exertion. So they're not just doing an exercise and just going through the motions of doing 10 reps, actually working really, really hard as part of that. So we'd work into that. And then what hasn't really been done in the past is working on muscle power. So that's rate of force development. So typically to address that, whether that be for performance or for someone who's injured, you would reduce your loads um, and then you would work on more so velocity of movement. And we see really big deficits in that in, in this patient population. And people might ask, well, why is that important? What I can tell you from some of the other work we've done is things like strength and rate of force development and muscle power don't really relate very well to subjective disability. So they don't actually have a strong relationship with that. And that's really important to acknowledge. But they do relate, particularly rate of force development and muscle power, to functional performance. So if someone has impaired rate of force development at their knee, for example, some recent work that is under review, I think it's been accepted now, shows that they land stiffer. So they have less ability to absorb load through their knee. To have less rate of force development muscle power through their hip and the hamstrings, they have impaired performance of hop for distance. So their athletic pursuits and performance from that perspective is lower. And it probably sets them up to have regression and, and pain and, and disability again down the track. So I think it's not the be all and end all. It's probably got a lot to do with psychological factors and getting people exercising and, and actively managing their condition. But from a performance perspective, those things are really important. And if we want people to have sustained benefits in terms of strength and, and muscle power, we need to work them to that level. So typically between week, week three and five, they got to a level where they were doing strength and not long after that, they got to the level where they could work on muscle power. As we progressed them through those different levels, we were ensuring that if we're targeting the gluteal muscles, that they're actually feeling the muscle load through there. It's so actually getting sore. If we're targeting the lower abdominals, they're feeling it through there. And then later down the track, we did bring in some quadriceps and hamstring exercises for some of these participants. And of course, they're feeling it there. Alongside that, we monitored pain. And you'll see in the appendix, there's a pain scale. So less than two, we're okay. Two to five, so that's towards the top. Two to five, we go, yeah, okay, we need to be just mindful. Um, if we sort of got more than two to, between two and five, we'd say we probably need to modify the exercise. Now, some people don't use these pain scales as well. So although we have this as our, I guess, printed guide we use with people, often anecdotally, the physios in treating in this study would say to people, well, is this pain acceptable to you? Is it increasing during mm -hmm. the exercise? If it was, it would be modified. You'd reduce the load might have a bit more emphasis on your muscular control, try and change things a little bit so that you're less likely to flare them. Um, and there's lots of debates about how much pain you should have during exercise in this patient population. And I don't stand here or sit here and say I have the answer. Um, I think the key is making sure that you don't flare them up 
afterwards rather than how much pain they have during. Because if you flare them up afterwards, you're going to make it harder for them to do their ex next exercise session. You're going to reduce their self-efficacy with exercise, et cetera. So it's more the response 24 hours later. So the other really important thing that we got them to monitor was 24 hours after you've done this exercise session, have you had any pain flare? And if they haven't, then that's a green light that we can keep progressing them and pushing them harder. Mm. Okay. And, and I know you've picked up uh, in, both in the introduction and, um, and in the exercise options, the adaptability and an opportunity for actually for, for patients and to physios to adapt those exercises to be specific to the patient. Um, sort of historically, some of the research has been quite didactic in, in the types yeah. of and wraps and, uh, that, that's being prescribed. And we know that just that clinically, if we try and apply the same thing to every person, that just doesn't work. So it's good to see a progressive program, which allows for flexibility with both patients and, and the clinician to be able to adapt those yeah. approaches. And I, when I design a research trial team, I have so many internal fights with myself about what it should look like from an intervention and methodological perspective, because there's a clinician in me that says, if you do this from a research perspective, don't matter what, doesn't matter what they say about scientific quality, this is not useful to clinicians. Um, and then of course, then the scientist in me says, well, if you kind of allow people to do what they want to do and have some adaptability, it's going to be criticized because it's harder to, to standardize. So I think there has to be a balance between that. And so hopefully by having my, um, had in both rings and having these internal arguments with myself, I somehow come to the middle and end up with a, a useful question for all parties. That's what I hope to do anyway. Yeah. Let's go down to anything else from a, from a methods or, or intervention perspective you want to touch on, or should we go down towards the, uh, the findings and the results? Um, probably one thing from a methods perspective uh, about strength testing that was really important that we developed or learnt along the way before we did this. A lot of people use handheld dynamometry in their clinic and I used to use it a lot as well. Um, one of the things that we tried to test out prior to doing this is what's the usefulness of, instead of using handheld dynamometry of doing things like 10 repetition maximum because that sometimes requires equipment often but often different equipment so if you've got a cable machine for example you can do a 10 repetition maximum of standing hip abduction hip extension mm -hmm. which is part of what we assessed um and arguably that's easier to monitor for the patient as well they don't have to have a handheld dynamometer and have someone do that so they're able to monitor their own strength gains going forward and it maps well to the exercise so before we did this we looked at reliability of a lot of different testing methods and we found that the 10 repetition maximum of those tests is something that's really really reliable and so that's something i use clinically across the board as well so that was something that we used from the exercise perspective i think um the one thing to highlight as well that we we really really tried to emphasize is is the point that there wasn't a perfect way to do the exercises, but what we wanted to ensure is rather than focused on mechanics of the way someone moves. And if you look at Pilates practice, you are rolling vertebrae down one at a time when you do bridges and things, and that all does my head in. Mm. What we wanted to make sure is when you did these exercises, you were sore in the muscles we were trying to build capacity of that we know have things like muscle atrophy and, and muscle weakness and loss of muscle power. That's what we're trying to focus on rather than pedantic movement patterns. So I think that was a couple of important things. Okay. Excellent. All right. We'll go down to the, uh, into the analysis component and we can see at the top of pay, uh, well, it's totaled 62 in the journal, but at the top of the page here, we can see the, the flow chart of the participants. And again, that, that just shows that we've got that, um, t the 10 participants through to the analysis at the end stage. I just no, I noticed in your eligibility criteria, part of the exclusion was previous interventions or previous physiotherapy care or acupuncture or anything else within the last six months. Did you find that that was prohibitive in, in the number of patients that actually were eligible for the trial or, or was that not too much? Um, no, I don't think so. I think um, it may have stopped people from responding because that was pretty clear at the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of people who responded, we didn't typically exclude them. Um, most people were excluded for previous knee traumas or, or um, surgeries and those types of things. Um, or there was a couple that maybe had slightly different musculoskeletal complaints, but the previous, in, previous intervention thing didn't really play a big role in having to exclude people. Um, so, and I think the other thing to acknowledge with this patient population and most musculoskeletal patient populations, they don't typically seek care that is of an exercise base or even physiotherapy or, or allied health base all that frequently, all that often. So there's a lot of people out there who are just not receiving care because they go to the GP and the GP says, oh, I'll just take some paracetamol. This, this will go away. 
way, you'll be okay. We know that's not the case. Mm. So I think a lot of them aren't actually receiving intervention. And so when it comes to recruiting this patient population, I've actually found it, we found it relatively easy to, to find them out in the community through social media advertisements, et cetera. And I think the feasibility aspect of this study shows that well. Okay, and good. And I'm, I'm uh, at studies like this that hopefully should get a few more GPs recommending uh, people do do a little bit more exercise and come for that type of care. But this, this, uh, this, we'll tell. this study will make no difference to that, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the subsequent studies will, I'm sure. Exactly, exactly. Programs like GLAD are helping. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Good. All right, let's, let's jump into the results then. So um, let's look from uh, your main outcome measures to start with then. So your, the actual feasibility component of the study around exercise uh, adherence. Um, do you want to tell us what, what the main findings were then? Yeah, so I guess the, the key thing, as I alluded to before, we tried to monitor this via PhysiApp. Um, yep. So it's PhysiTrack. And you can see when you look at it, the adherence is pretty good. So they're completing... Their, their prescribed exercise. Um, most people were doing that in the, in the first few weeks and then it drops off a little bit and drops off a little bit further as we go along. But anecdotally talking to patients and we didn't take a good measure of this because we didn't think about it at the beginning, they kept doing their exercises. They just stopped using the app because they become really comfortable with the exercises. So one of the things that I like about this as an exercise program and I used a lot in my clinical practice is we didn't keep giving them a new exercise. So we wanted to challenge their hip further. We didn't suddenly take them into doing an arabesque or, or trying to change and modify and make this complicated exercise. We kept it really simple. We just loaded it up more, worked on muscle power, so more rate of force development. Arguably, patients might become bored of that and that could be a barrier to them doing it. But actually, most really appreciate the fact that you're not changing it on them and they know they've got that skill in doing the exercise and they kept progressing it. So overall, the adherence of the program, I think, was, was really good, but the data we have is, is not great to actually measure that. That's probably the key thing. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Are you aware of any, any research that compares more complicated exercise interventions versus more basic progressive interventions from a, from a compliance perspective? That would be interesting to see. Hmm. I'm, I'm not, but if, if anyone does know of any, I'd love to have a read of them. Um, yeah. It is interesting. I think um, we have a focus at the clinic, which you, you work out as well, and, and most of our exercise prescription is kept really simple yeah. um, for the reason that bias, that there's some clinical bias around that, but I think it's much easier for people to adhere to if you keep things yeah. simple. They don't want too many things to do, and they don't want it to be too complicated, and that allows them to have independence. Yeah, it's very, and it's very difficult to progress to actually strengthen and power based training that we know is yeah, so uh, important with such variability of different types of exercises. And just on that note, we, we didn't be very prescriptive about you have to do this number of sessions for your guidance. We, we said you could have up to eight over 12 weeks. Um, typically, people only had five or six. So they might have come once every week or two at the beginning, and then by the end, they're coming once a month. So because the program was such a simple design of exercise and able to be progressed almost independently by someone after a few weeks, they could do it themselves because they learned about they probably knew just as much as most health professionals about exercise prescription by the end. Um, they were able to progress it themselves. And I think that was a really important aspect of the study as well. Yeah. And it might, be, it might be a difficult one to answer, but do we know what, if there was what the influence was on that single participant that had the pain flare up during the event? Are you aware of any? Was, was it specifically related to some of the exercise stuff? Did the pain, yeah, one major pain flare and... And it actually happened to a participant who just started doing their own exercise. So in the gym and they just decided they wanted to get back into squatting. And so they were feeling good and confident and they smashed themselves with some squatting and they ended up having quite a decent pain flare. It settled down pretty quick. I think it settled down after a week or so and they were able to keep going through the program. So that was the only major pain flare we had. Certainly we had some small increases in pain during the exercises, but we were really careful with that at the beginning that, yep, pain's okay, but we want to make sure that there's not this significant increase 24 hours later. And that was probably when you talk about education, that was probably the main education that they were probably provided beyond that leaflet was, was mm. that concept about monitoring pain flares. Mm. Okay. All right. And then in terms of the actual patient reported outcome measures, do you want to touch on, on the main findings there? Yeah. So we, the outcome measures were a secondary part of this study because it's yeah. low powered and there's no control group, but we, we looked at a few, we looked at a uh, global rating of change. And so this is basically the patient's perception of how they've done anywhere from completely recovered, markedly better all the way through to markedly worse. What I found surprising is we, 
we gave a very simple intervention, very simple exercise program that was progressed really well. And we had nine out of the 10 reported at least marked improvement in their condition. So that was their subjective feeling about how they were going. So I found that surprising that we had that number. And if you can compare that to different clinical trials, which do have control groups and are really well designed studies, that actually looks pretty good. That's actually a really good improvement. Obviously, we wanted to look at pain because that's something that's very important to patients. And we saw quite massive improvements in pain. So we're talking an average of sort of close to six, which is pretty standard for this population. So that's their worst pain in the last week. And that dropped down to about an average of one. So this was quite a massive difference in pain reduction too. Again, that surprised me. I didn't expect the outcome to be that good with such a simplistic exercise program. So it was really good to challenge my clinical bias on that because even though I like to keep things simple, I often make them a little bit more complicated than what this study is. Um, Cruise patellofemoral um, scale, that's more looking at what we call knee-related quality of life, so someone's confidence in their knee to do things. And again, we saw quite big improvements in that. So 14-point change is something that's considered um, very clinically meaningful, which is alongside the, the pain improvements. We also looked at a measure of subjective disability of anterior knee pain scale, and so around that 14-15 change as well, which again is a, is a decent... Um, so this is decent improvement. This is people's own perceptions, their ability to do things like stairs or jump or do certain activities. Um, so we saw some really good improvements from those subjective outcomes. Um, the other subjective outcomes we looked at were the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia. Um, arguably, we could create a better measure of pain-related fear and, and fear of movement, but Tampa is quite widely used and, and we found it useful in our patient population. We did see some improvements in it. Um, but they weren't statistically significant in this cohort and they're quite variable. And that makes some logic that they might improve a little bit in that by progressively loading them with exercise, that should theoretically make them more confident in their knee overall. But underlying what it tells us is we didn't see massive improvements in, in kinesophobia. So probably where targeted education or even targeted exercise at this um, would be potentially really valuable. And I talked about the website before that we've developed and we've tested that in a a cohort of people and we'll hopefully have some research published on that soon but just using a website with education and a self-directed exercise program they seem to do better in with kinesiophobia than a progressive resistance training program like this physical activity um, really varied some people become more active some people less active and i think this is typically what we see with exercise therapy programs and even general education programs of people with persistent musculoskeletal conditions they end up with far better capacity to be more physically active, but they don't always become more physically active because there's so many other elements that play into that family, work, um, motivation to do it, a whole range of things. And some areas we're really interested in at Latrobe now is how we can address the psychological factors to get people to become more physically active post interventions like this or post other exercise programs, et cetera. So that was, yeah, that sort of talks you through the subjective findings we had. That's, uh, I, yeah, I, re I really liked the inclusion when I first looked at that physical activity, but the complexity of it makes a lot of sense. All of, obviously, the secondary benefits that we all pertain to be supporting and, and uh, encourage with our patients have just increased general physical activity. We know is so important, but so it's, yeah. it's interesting. And, it's included. and in, the, yeah. in the clinic, I would write an aerobic exercise plan for people. I do that all the time. But in this study, we, we didn't do that. We just left it and saw what yep. they did. Um, the thing that you also need to acknowledge is that we use the IPAC, which is a measure of physical activity. It's mm -hmm. subjective. Um, it's not an amazing measure. It's, it's got some questionable validity about how well that relates to objective function. Oh, sorry, objective measures of physical activity. So that's also something to, to acknowledge. But my guess is if we didn't see subjective improvements, I don't think we would have seen objective improvements. So that's really important. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's get down to the other of the secondary outcomes in, in hip muscle capacity. Yep. So I think this really speaks to exercise specificity a lot in terms of what we find with, with muscle capacity changes. In the lead up to this, we've done lots of research ourselves and many others have done lots of research in muscle capacity at the hip. And so you can measure hip strength isometrically. So using handheld dynamometry, for example, 10 repetition maximum, which I mentioned before. And then we've also developed some methods to measure rate of force development and muscle power. Um, so basically that's how quick, how quick can you generate the force? Not just how much force you can generate, but how quick you, can you generate it? And so we wanted to look at all these different things. Um, and so what we looked at with, with isometric strength as we looked at hip abduction and extension and we looked at the same movement patterns for the 10 repetition maximum they were done in standing and then we did the same for power and we found significant improvements 
in all of those things except for hip extension. But even hip extension, there was a pretty decent statistical trend that there was an improvement in terms of how much strength they had. What was really interesting is we didn't do any isometric strength exercises with this group. They're all isotonic exercises and isometric strength improved, but nowhere near as much as the 10 repetition maximum. So that more isotonic or dynamic strength, that's where we got the greatest gains. And the way we progressed the exercise program and what they did, most of these people between week three and five were doing exercises working towards 10 repetition maximum. So they're working on that for a good couple of months. And so it makes plenty of sense that they saw massive improvements in their 10 repetition maximum testing. Their muscle power, we also see big improvements, but they typically didn't work on those for as long. The other interesting thing to note is that we, when we got them to the level of doing power, at that point, they were meant to do a minimum of two sessions a week with an optional third and ideally third. And the two sessions was to be one strength, one power. And then they could choose what the third one was. Um, interestingly enough, most people like the strength exercises a little bit easier, easier to control. And so they typically do more of that than the muscle power. So if we did more time with muscle power or more emphasis on muscle power, we might see great improvements in that again. Now, which is more important, you might ask. And the short answer to that is we really don't know. And it may really depend on the functional activities that people want to get back to. So as I mentioned before, things like hop for distance, um, and landing and those types of things, muscle power becomes far more important than say something like strength. Um, but maybe strength for going upstairs and downstairs and those types of activities may be more relevant. So that's some considerations for us to, to think about. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and as you as you said, it looks um, it looks clear that when we look at the principles of specific adaptations, you've got a group that are generally focusing on uh, isotonic activities, and and therefore that's where we get the biggest gains. Um, and to work out what's most important for people is probably a little bit down the track, uh, and greater power focus might might be more applicable. And it's stupidly logical what we found yeah. in the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's why you do this stuff, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, that's, that's fantastic. Now, now we're starting to run up um, to, uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, Christian. I really appreciated what we've gone through so far. A couple just the last couple of questions I've got is that in hindsight, looking back at that methodology and, and considering the results that you got, um, is there anything that in hindsight you would have changed or done differently if you were to repeat this same sort of feasibility study? Yeah, I think the biggest limitation, even in an unfunded study like this, would be having a control group. I think that's really important because what we don't know is what would happen to that control group um, in terms of pain, in terms of disability, kinesophobia, physical activity, but equally their strength. And, and what we, we may see is that actually pain has a big influence on strength. And so maybe if someone just naturally gets better in terms of pain, does their strength then improve? And I suspect that's probably partially true. So if we're going to still keep a confined, simple study, not going too big without a lot of funding, I think having a control group could be really useful. Um, going back to the pragmatics of it, the PhD student I had working on this study with me had a limited time in Australia, so had 12 months. And so recruiting the amount of people we would need to also have a control group would have been challenging. And then when you have a control group, the question is, what do you do with them at the end of the study? Is there an obligation to also provide them intervention? And so that adds to cost of the study and, and et cetera, et cetera. So that was the reason we didn't do that. But I think the simple improvement would be just add a control group for this. And then of course, looking at powering it more appropriately to actually be confident in our findings. Yeah. And I know this is uh, just a feasibility study at this stage, but if you've got a patient with patellofemoral pain uh, experiencing this complaint, what would you want them to know uh, from this paper? Uh, doing some simple things really well can have a really positive effect on your pain. Um, and you can start these types of exercises early. So just because you're in a flared up condition with your knee doesn't mean you can't start on this rehab from the beginning and so this is a really nice starting point for exercise but equally this has got some limitations in that this wouldn't have addressed any impairments in muscle strength at the knee or calf that we might see and we have good evidence at the knee and maybe some at the calf as well and the other thing is this doesn't go any way to addressing those psychological factors that we might see related to the condition so having understanding of, of some of our pain science principles and understanding how our pain system works is, is really important. So although this simple intervention is helpful, if you wanted to get your optimal outcome, then I think you need to make sure you spend some time with your health professional learning about the condition 
condition in terms of pain and those types of things and, and get a really good understanding of that if you're going to do well in the long term because we know this condition is something that once someone's had it for a long period of time it's unlikely to just go away so it's something that you need to hit with quite a few interventions don't have to need lots of health professional contact time and i think that's the other important thing to highlight to people but it certainly takes a bit of buy-in from the person to understand the condition and maybe work hard with some exercise yeah that's fantastic and i know that was highlighted quite clearly in the paper and we're seeing that across various different areas that unless we're doing a good 12 weeks of progressive rehab training um, we really should be you know, not necessarily considering some of those um, surgical and other interventions until that's, we've had a good go at this type of approach. And it was good to see that duration in this paper. So thank you so much, Christian. I really appreciate your time today. Well, Great to hear that, that detail. And, and I know clinicians and, and early career researchers will be really appreciating it. Not my pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me on. And uh, just lastly, if people aren't already uh, following you on, on bits of social media, just uh, give that a quick uh, plug for me. Yeah. Uh, so social media wise, probably easiest place to find me is on Twitter. So yeah. at Dr. Chris Barton is my Twitter handle. Um, yeah. So feel free to interact. If you've got questions, post this, feel free to ask them online as well. Very happy to, to try and answer it. Um, in short, if you ask me a question and you don't have a profile that's also publicly facing and I don't know where you are and where you're from, I'll probably just block you just for a reference. But if you ask me questions, I know who you are. I'm very happy to engage with anyone. Um, and that's really important. I think it's important we have lots of conversations and all learn from each other. And that's why I love social media. Fantastic. Good open discussion. That's what we like. All right. Thanks, Christian. Have a good day, Tim.